good evening and welcome to this Tortoise Thinking on the really uh, key question uh, of the role that scientific advice has had during the pandemic, somewhat laterally referred to there by Girls Aloud. Um, it isn't a straightforward question, uh, but it's one that's essential both to our rolling audit of uh, what went right and what went wrong, um, but also how we can do better uh, in the future. I, my name is Matt Dancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise and I'll be chairing uh, tonight's discussion. We, we have a, a, a truly fantastic lineup of, of, of dauntingly distinguished speakers. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, hearing what they have to say, but do remember that the purpose of our open newsroom at Tortoise is to hear from you. Um, so do let us know what's on your mind um, in the chat, which tonight is being overseen by my colleague Zav Greenwood. Um, the point about the pandemic, of course, is that by definition, um, semantically, it, so it has embraced anything and everything. But what I'm really hoping for tonight is that we can keep the focus quite tight upon the advice that ministers have received from scientists, the way that scientists have behaved in relation to the political machine, and specifically, though not uh, only, the, the question of the role of SAGE, the scientific advisory group for emergencies. And I think SAGE is uh, very interesting because it, it was only, I, I didn't know this quite recently, it was only brought into being formally in 2009 to help with swine flu. It's not a standing committee. A lot of people imagine it as a kind of um, scientific equivalent of the cabinet, but it, it isn't that. It met once, only once in 2019, which was to consider the potential collapse of uh, a dam, a uh, reservoir dam chaired by Sir Patrick Vallance, the Chief Scientific Advisor, who, as we all know, has been co-piloting with Professor Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer. Um, both of them have become very familiar faces in, 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 and, and publicly uh, associated with the pandemic in its ups and downs. Um, what we know about its members, is about eight, we know about 85 of them, uh, their, their names, and its minutes are now generally published within a month of the relevant meeting, although we may return to that question um, uh, in, later in the discussion. So um, timing limited, I'd really like to dive straight in and look at the question of whether it's worked, has it done its job, where has it succeeded, where has it, where has it failed? Um, and turn to uh, Professor Anthony Costello, who is um, Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at UCL and many other roles. Um, and Anthony, welcome. I suppose the, the question that, that sort of sits with me first is what was given what I've just said, was SAGE as a, as a structure remotely ready for the hammer blow of what came its way in February, March last year? Well, the first thing I would say is that, that most scientists on SAGE well, all of the scientists on stage acted with good intentions. Many of them were working in their spare time. Uh, they did it for free, all the independent ones. And so, you know, the success or otherwise of a, a scientific advisory group of experts depends crucially upon who's invited to join, its culture of openness, and also the balance of the independence versus the government employees and, and and so the first thing that struck me was that of the 23 members that were listed as the primary people i mean the 85 are people that dip in and out but the 23 members at the beginning was that i think 13 or 14 of them were paid government employees uh whereas there were only i think nine possibly 10 independent advisors now that's important because look, I went, I worked at WHO, and as soon as I went there, they said you're no longer an independent scientist. Your job is to facilitate meetings with independent scientists. Obviously, you can contribute, but it's the, the opinions of the independent scientists they were interested in. So the, the next thing is the balance. And what we really needed was a pandemic crisis team. And if you look at you know pandemic crisis teams at WHO, and I was involved in the Zika virus uh, pandemic, um, you know, they said, well, we had a big meeting room, we had all the panels up from people all around the world, 
And you had a manager there, you had the emergency experts, you had the scientists, the clinicians, you may have one modeler, you'd have disease trackers, you'd have uh, communications people, logisticians, and people from the front line, you know, who were gonna be doing all the work, the primary care people, the intensive care people. Now that wasn't the format of science. So the definition of science within SAGE was not about implementation science or population science. They didn't have a single public health person actually there, not an independent person. They had some people from Public Health England. So the balance in my view was wrong. They had, amongst the independents, they had three um, clinical academics like Chris Whitty, who's a very good clinical epidemiologist, you know, Jeremy Farrer, and uh, I don't think Mark Walpert was on it at that stage, uh, but, um, and they had two or three behavioral scientists and about three mathematical modelers. Now, you know, as WHO said way back on January the 29th, when it was clear that this was exploding. In fact, I sent a message to Tedros's sidekick, um, one of his advisors who I knew quite well on the 27th saying- The director the, general of the- uh, yeah, yeah, of WHO. And I said, for God's sake, you know, declare a public health emergency of international concern, because if you don't, WHO is gonna get the flack. Um, and indeed they did about four days later after Tedros and, and Mike Ryan, the head of emergencies had been to China to visit uh, Xi Jinping. So we should have, at, at that stage, we already knew this was exploding. We knew this wasn't flu. This was much more serious. Uh, and, you know, at that stage I was quoting some figures. I said, look, there are 17 countries are already infected. There's likely 250,000 cases in China. The Lancet have published a paper. So we knew all this by the end of January that things were really bad. And this was way worse than a flu. You know, people were dropping dead in the streets in China. So at that stage, I had assumed that the pandemic crisis team or what turned out to be SAGE would be looking at this and following the, the WHO advice, which was, find cases as quickly as possible. Speed was of the es essence. Mike Ryan always used to say, the greatest error is not to move. Mm. Get your testing up and running, get your systems in for tracing contacts and uh, make sure you isolate everyone as quickly as possible because that's gonna lock it down. And we knew that this COVID was, had a faster transmissibility time. You know, the R0 uh, was more than double that of flu. But it's interesting the 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 the, the mobile bit in all of it, Anthony, is the is the sort of what what constitutes we in that which by which I I take it you mean um, the scientific community generally, and it, you're certainly right that, that that many people by quite early on, you know, uh, early February were warning of significant loss of life. But what's interesting is if you go back to the sage minutes of that period, say around February the fourth, there there. The minutes say, you know, advising caution in communicating potentially high fatality rates to the public um, because the issue is, quote, complex. So is there a sort of, I'm interested in the extent to which there's a, there's a sort of settled group think in SAGE, um, which doesn't actually operate like a dialectic and, and, and kick ideas around until they, you know, you, you arrive at a proper solution, but a, but a kind of at that point, at least, a tendency towards caution. Absolutely. And, and I think they got the risk wrong uh, early on because they should have upgraded this to a very high risk, whereas they decided that it was still relatively low risk in early February. Um, and indeed, there was a bit of dispute later on in February when I think John Edmonds yeah. wanted it to be upgraded to high risk, but the others didn't. Um, yeah, they, I, I, I mean, very early on, and I don't know precisely when, but early in February, it seems that the, the viral people the vi from Nerve Tag, that's the new and emerging respiratory viruses technical advisory group, they believe that this, they were following the pandemic influenza plan, that this was going to sweep through countries, there was not much you could do about it, and therefore you have to let it, you know, take it on the chin, to quote 
the Prime Minister, yes. who, of course, was not attending any of the COBRA meetings at that stage. Um, and, you know, you had to live with it. And, that, and they so they came up with this strategy, which we're still arguing about, which was, you know, theirs was to contain, to uh, research, to mitigate, I can't remember the fourth word, but it was basically to say, we'll contain for a bit and then we'll just let it run and we have to protect the NHS. And, you know, if they'd had an independent public health person along, like Gabriel Scali or Dipti, um, th this wouldn't have happened because they would have been screaming. So you've got to lock this down. That's what WHO is saying. That's what South Korea have already done. By the end of February, South Korea and China were getting this under control. And China's the biggest country in the world. You would think there's no way they could get that under control. And it wasn't simply because, you know, they're a more oppressive state. South Korea certainly isn't, nor is Taiwan, nor Hong Kong. They, they did it because they followed eventually for China. They didn't, they started very badly, but then they followed basic public health principles and put into practice, find, test, trace, isolate. Whereas we um, opted not to do that. And, and this, you know, I mean, Jeremy Hunt interrogated this and said this was the greatest scientific failure to ministers in a generation. It's difficult not to completely agree. But I'll just say one other thing. On March the 9th, um, one of the modelers that fed in, one of the senior modelers at Imperial wrote a paper, this is Stephen Riley, and he said, he did, it's quite a detailed paper, and he said, um, simply trying to contain this and, and within the NHS was potentially gonna be disastrous and that we had to contain it and really clamp down and, and went for the kind of suppression strategy that we've been arguing for, for a year. And it was interesting, Neil Ferguson wouldn't sign that and they took it to SAGE. And then they came out with the statement you put up at the beginning saying, we unanimously agree, there's inevitably gonna be a second surge and China will have it and blah, blah, blah. And here we are now, our death rates are nearly 2000 per million, uh, China's is three per million, Vietnam is less than one per million, Taiwan less than one per million. You know, the, the difference is massive. And, and I think that advice was being given to Sage, but they chose not to. They, they backed the wrong horse, basically. And I think they did it with the best of intentions, but I think they were wrong. Thanks, Anthony. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you later, surely. Um, let, let's go actually now to Deepti, Deepti uh, Gurasani, who's a senior lecturer at uh, Queen Mary University, London, uh, and a distinguished epidemiologist and statistical geneticist. Um, welcome, Deepti. Uh, there seem in all of this, um, I don't want to uh, fasten too much on the beginnings, but it does seem that a lot of the problems that followed had their roots at the start, that there was this early conflict between uh, those advisors and indeed politicians who favoured what became known as the herd immunity strategy. Um, uh, and those who were saying, look, we need tough containment, look at what's happening in Asia where countries are actually dealing with it, as Anthony was saying. Uh, John Edmonds, you know, talking about 370 deaths, 1,000 deaths um, as early as late February. Sage minutes show they're being warned of half a million deaths around the same time. So what's, what's driving that uh, argument and why isn't it resolved more quickly? So I think early on comparisons were made with flu because that's potentially, you know, the one sort of pandemic that maybe our scientific community was familiar with. I think there was also a huge degree of exceptionalism. So actually in many ways we were lucky because this pandemic got to us about three months after, you know, it, it ravaged many other parts of the world, including Southeast Asia, including, um, you know, even Italy was before us. So we had a long time to actually learn lessons from what was happening around us. But rather than learn lessons from the real experience of countries, so even, you know, when the pandemic started here, South Korea had brought this under control. Many parts of Southeast Asia, I remember at that time, were actually containing this very, very well and had just put in basic public health measures that were clearly working. And we were seeing differences in death rates and case numbers between countries completely based on their responses. But rather than look at the real world data in front of us, we chose to look at models and decided 
that, for example, quarantine was not effective, which we now completely know it is because we've seen it work in the real world. We decided that we need to stop testing uh, because you know it wasn't effective moving from containment to the delay phase is what we were told, although it was central or the central backbone of response in any every country that was managing to contain this. In fact, there were countries that didn't even go into lockdown because they were able to contain this with test rates and isolate. So there was a degree of arrogance and exceptionalism. And I think that comes from potentially not having had this kind of global public health experts there. And I often wonder why didn't SAGE have people from, you know, Hong Kong, China, Singapore, Taiwan, you know, those people were ahead of us. They had real world experience. So why it's, did we not have those? It's really interesting what you say, Duty, though, because about exceptionalism, because I mean, you one, I certainly have an image of of the, you know, the, 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 the British scientist as being someone who is by, almost by definition connected to and interdependent on uh, a, a network of international scholarship and research and um, is that, is, that, is that actually a, a fantastically naive view? That's not been my experience or my impression for many scientists. In fact, you see that even now, even now, we are comparing this to the flu, although we know it's completely different. Even now we have scientists, not just in SAGE, but within our scientific community who are consistently minimizing risks that we know are real and exist. You know, minim uh, minimizing risks related to long COVID, related to new variants, related to aerosol transmission. We've been slow on all of these things. And it's, I think we really have to reflect on the nature of the UK scientific community. And I mean, not just SAGE. There's a lot of misinformation that's been spread by various corners of our scientific community. Um, and I know scientists in Southeast Asia have looked at us and thought, what's going on here? You know, why are people arguing about aerosol transmission 15 months into this pandemic when we were wearing masks on day one? You know, why don't we have mitigation schools? <laughs> what is going on here? And, and frankly, I'm completely astonished by um, how our scientific community has failed us, not just our government. Okay, uh, I mean, another, uh, another example of that, it, it was the, you know, the SAGE minutes the week before Cheltenham and the uh, the match between Liverpool and Atletico Madrid, 52,000 strong crowd, said there's no evidence to suggest that banning very large gatherings would reduce transmission. This, by that state, was surely scientific nonsense, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's <laughs> there's research that shows it's actually one of the most effective measures in containing the pandemic with actually mitigations in schools or closure of schools being the second most effective measures. So, you know, we've completely, I don't know, minimized a lot of the evidence uh, around this and I don't know why. And another thing that I've noticed with the UK scientific community is we want 100% rigorous evidence before we act. That's not how you work in a pandemic. I mean, I think Anthony put it really well. Inaction and indecision cost lives in this point of time. So when you have uncertainty, don't assume the best. But here we always assume the best. We can compare it to flu. You know, we dismiss the risk of long COVID. We dismiss that children could be affected. We dismiss so many things early on. And unfortunately, we were hoping for the best. But if you look at what actually happened, all the worst predictions came true. This was an aerosol transmitted virus. It was highly infectious. Unfortunately, children were susceptible, although people thought they weren't. Uh, people had long-term illness. So it wasn't like the flu. Yep. Uh, people said it wasn't adaptable. There were new variants that were more transmissible and more fatal. In, in so many respects, we've assumed the best and hoped for the best. But we've been wrong repeatedly, but we never learn and we don't adopt the precautionary principle. We continue thinking that, okay, hopefully we will get this right this time. Thank, thank you very much, Tifi. We'll, we'll return to you, of course. Um, can, can I turn to uh, Ian Golden now, who's um, amongst many other things, uh, Oxford University Professor of Globalization and Development and also uh, author of a, um, a much anticipated book uh, on the post-COVID world called Rescue, which is coming out in May. Um, Ian, I mean, wasn't it again to this early phase, something of a schoolboy error to dump community testing and contact tracing on uh, early in March? I mean, what, wasn't that, wasn't that just asking for trouble? Yeah, I think somewhat ironically, because I think I'm the non-medical scientist on this panel. 
Uh, let me defend science a little bit. What I think we don't know about is the relationship between the politics and the science. Yeah. I mean, I would love to be a fly on the wall and see what Dominic Cummings was doing uh, in SAGE and how the minutes were being massaged between uh, SAGE and Downing Street. Um, and I, to me, uh, the, the jury's out on this. I know many of the scientists and other panelists know them even better and I respect them enormously. And certainly what I gather from private conversations is that the alarm bells were ringing loud and there was a political overrule, basically. I, I think where um, Dipti has really hit the nail on the head is it's this arrogance and exceptionalism. Is it an accident that the two countries with the strongest science, the US and the UK, have the worst response to the pandemic. And I think the two things that I would sort of draw from that is one is an assumption by the scientists that they don't have to follow WHO guidelines, guidelines and can do it themselves. And the second is both overruled by politicians who really were populist and had very different concerns and views about their own power. You know, in the US we've seen with the same scientists basically in, around a dramatic change in the control of COVID. What does that tell me? It tells me it's not science, it's politics uh, that shapes this. You look around the world and you see comparing countries, whether it's Turkey and Brazil or Vietnam and Mongolia and China or New Zealand, Australia, Greece in Europe, the, one of the best responses. It's not about their scientific capabilities. It's not about whether they have the scientists advising their governments. It's about whether the governments are capable of listening to people their own scientists, and most importantly, to the global community. And it's that view that you're exceptional, I think, or um, that, and that you can override the scientists that's dangerous. I also would, I think, take task with, with um, Dipti's assumption about, you know, firstly, what do we mean by scientists? Okay, the assumption seems to be this is medical science. In other areas, the UK has done fabulously, not least on the, the vaccine, uh, built on, you know, generations of deep research uh, coming out of that. But I noticed, um, Matt, in your in your beginning, you put up a slide uh, which was created with Our World in Data. Uh, you know, another British example of social scientists who are very much at the forefront of the analytics around the pandemic used now by all global sources uh, under to understand the pandemic. And I think one of the challenges, and I think it's the challenge in SAGE, which they're beginning to address, is that science has taken to mean medical science. And actually one thing we've learned very, very clearly from this pandemic is that if you only take it to be medical science, you're bound to fail. It's about behavior. It's about uh, many, many other things that aren't medical science domain. And that uh, one of the challenges I think for medical scientists is to talk to, to other scientists um, and to especially social scientists as, as well. The, the final point um, I, I, I think that relates to this is I think all pandemic specialists knew that this was going to happen. I mean, what we didn't know is where and when it would go on. I mean, I, I interviewed Peter Peart for my BBC series um, after the crash, and we concluded by saying- That was on the World Service, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, the next it's pandemic is going to be there. But, you know, it's not new. Angela McLean, who, who, who's, you know, chief scientist at, um, at MOD and on SAGE has been saying pandemics are inevitable. People have been saying this uh, for a long time, yet we devote maybe 10,000th of the resource to stopping pandemics than we devote to stopping wars. Uh, and it gets about that amount of attention of governments when there's not a pandemic. That's the real question is why, not so much why SAGE wasn't ready, but why governments whose role is to safeguard us uh, are so dramatically unprepared for pandemics. And will, and you know, the big question, and that's what I, I focus on in, in rescue is will we, is this a wake up call? Or are we just gonna be back to the old normal? Uh, is SAGE gonna revert to how it's always been? Or is this gonna lead to some system change? Unless it does, I think we're just in a cycle of these things. And it's not only pandemics, of course, it's other shocks, financial crises, climate change, and many others that, that, that will hit us. So the big question to me is about risk management and the way that society, especially short-run populist governments, uh, handle risk management. 
and and what you just said Ian, is absolutely fascinating um about the the relationship between scientists and politicians uh, which was very public and and indeed remains so but it was um it was compellingly and strikingly and newly public at that point you had a government that had come to power on the back of brexit um mocking experts suddenly flanking yeah. itself with experts and um the the spin was uh that the politicians were following the science or being led by the science but there's a the, the, there's some in what you say there's the kernel of a, a different truth which was that actually to some extent the scientists were uh being ventriloquized by the uh by the, the, the by the politicians i mean you know, the classic example being you know chris witty saying actually if you go too soon if you go locked down too soon people get fatigued the very next day sage meets i think this is march the 13th and says exactly the opposite which is there's no evidence of that at all which leads one to suppose what you know was the relationship the power relationship frankly between um advisors and ministers healthy and was it and was it healthy to put it on display in that way yeah i think i mean i think that is it and and that's you know i just don't have that information but i think the scientists are at grave danger of being discredited because they're used by the politicians and they've got to be very careful when they flank the prime minister that they are never saying anything that they don't 100 percent believe in and I, I know chris and patrick i'm sure have but in the early days that was i think very very challenging and um uh when you know the prime minister's in a way uh now gone on board with with the uh, scientists but that there was such a misalignment at the beginning and it was as you say on the back of of brexit and an extremely divided country that's the other lesson you learn from around the world of course divided countries don't handle pandemics well um and um so uh it, it I, I i would place the blame that you know that i think a lot of people are placing at the hands of the scientists at the at at the at the politicians um table thank you thank you very much we'll, we'll, we'll obviously come back to you um, i'd like to turn to gabriel scally who's a visiting professor of public health at university of bristol uh, and uh, professor president of epidemiology and public health royal society of medicine um gabriel welcome um as we move through the, 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 this process um you know lockdown one taking account of what ian just said about the, the this this rather tense and often um unbalanced relationship between politicians and advisors did did witty and valence clearly were unhappy with the speed with which lockdown was relaxed the first lockdown was relaxed um did they make it clear enough could they have done more was this an opportunity to go public i mean what what was their what was the, the limit of what they could reasonably be expected to do at that point? Well, I think, first of all, we need to understand that uh, Witty and Balance are civil servants predominantly. That's what they're paid to be. They're not paid to do science. They're paid to speak science to uh, and give advice to uh, the, the ministers. And I, I, I do think there is an issue about how they have been used and uh, the civil service code is as a former senior civil servant myself uh, when I was a regional director of public health uh, in England I, I know very well that you need to be very careful when you are appearing alongside ministers that you are not dealing in matters of political controversy that could undermine your standing in case you are replaced by a new administration so I think there is a real issue for the future about the positioning of key people in the civil service at uh, at the centre. I, I have a great deal of sympathy for uh, Chris Whitty and Patrick Balance because this is a public health uh, emergency, the like of which none of us have experienced in our lifetime. And yet, as Anthony suggested with SAGE, uh, there were uh, no practical public health people involved in SAGE. Uh, neither were there senior public health people at the in the top jobs and we went into this pandemic with a, a, an enormously weakened public health system in the country and uh, of the of the four chief medical officers for the first time in our history uh, we were in a, a, a terrible situation where 
of those four, only one of the chief medical officers, the Welsh chief medical officer, had uh, a training qualification and experience in public health. So the public health system was extraordinarily weak. And uh, the, that left a vacuum that the, the scientific uh, part of the apparatus, which is valuable undoubtedly, but was used as a substitute for the whole thing. And I, I think we ended up with, uh, and, and that scientific apparatus uh, didn't have practical public health people in it either. So part of the, uh, the, the problem is that we ended up with this extraordinarily public health impoverished uh, community. I mean, I, I was thinking as my, your other guests were talking about uh, scientists and, and their role and so on. Well, I, if you go back in history and look how we've handled epidemic disease and pandemic disease uh, in this country, this country led the world in the sanitary revolution of the 19th century in dealing with these diseases and they dealt with them on public health principles. They didn't understand uh, the infection mechanism. They didn't understand infection. They were still operating on the principles of dealing with a miasma. But the principles that they adopted are principles that we have completely and absolutely neglected in this, in this pandemic. For example, the principle of quarantine is, you know, what people would do, uh, seeing people fall down dead in the street, they would close their doors, they would uh, put up the barriers to peop new people coming in, uh, they would uh, do many of this, uh, including wearing masks at times in history, they did all these things and we, we didn't have that public health tradition left anymore. And part of that, part of the other problem, I think, and the way it became such a centralized response, I mean, it really was hugely centralized, is that particularly in England over the last decade, we've had a hollowing out of the state really quite considerably. Uh, there is no regional apparatus anymore. There were, I, I was part of it. I was responsible for handling major health emergencies in my region, the Southwest region. And, and, and we dealt with them uh, in an integrated fashion across all the government departments that were in the government offices of the region. And uh, that all disappeared and was wiped away, including with the resilience framework uh, that was in place to support it from across the country. Um, there are no local public health bodies anymore. There's NHS England's centralized model, model of a body and then uh, and the entire NHS system turned over to a, a either contracting or commissioning services, not actually doing things. So to go back to something Anthony said at the very beginning, there was, there was, there was no group of people in the centre who were used to doing public health things uh, just when we had a major emergency. So I regard that as the weakness that led a science and an inadequate science, which is often, I think, voyeuristic and, and responsive, rather, uh, that, that issue that was touched on. Uh, they, want to, they want to see the evidence. Well, here we have a brand new virus of which we don't know the, uh, the natural history of. Uh, we, we don't know how it's, going to, how it's going to act. So you've got to go back and stick with the public health principles that you would use for dealing with any serious outbreak. And that whole uh, area of the UK's functioning disappeared, had disappeared. So that left us in the situation we were in. So but just, just to push the point, Gabriel, I mean, you make a very good point about the role of officials and the, the limitations that they have as advisors, but they have, Witty and Valance have been put into positions that uh, Crown officials have very rarely been exposed to, which was, you know, public ambassadorship. And Boris Johnson had the power, and Matt Hancock had the power, but they had the authority. So they did have leverage. And so when you came to the, the, the those crucial months in the summer where, you know, Sage was saying, look, don't reduce the advisory on um, uh, how far people should stay apart from two metres to one. They were, and Sage wasn't consulted on um, Eat Out to Help Out. What, you know, wasn't this the point for Witty and Valance not just to be, as it were, Sir Humphreys, but to, to actually step up to the plate as, as uh, public figures, that, which they had been made by the government, and, ex and use that authority? Certainly, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And there's a very good, th though to use that authority, you've got to remember these roles in these times are very solitary roles. And I think uh, particularly Chris Whitty's predecessors had 
around them a very solid group of deputy chief medical officers, regional directors of public health uh, from across uh, the England and the CMOs of the uh, other countries who were very uh, experienced public health figures. Um, but on, on this occasion, none of that was there to support them. And you're quite right. I mean, I can think of uh, two instances. Uh, one is, um, it's not generally known, but Sir Kenneth Kalman, who was a fine chief medical officer, uh, as I would say to him, despite being a surgeon, uh, but he'd been well trained in public health in, in, in Scotland as CMO before he came to England. And he had the, all these people around him. And he resigned twice during the course of the variant CJD. Um, uh, really serious emergency and uh, on both occasions it was on a matter of principle and on neither occasions was his resignation accepted and he had his way. Similarly Liam Donaldson uh, absolutely put himself uh, on the forefront in, in breaching the convention which is that uh, uh, senior civil servants including the chief medical officer will not oppose government uh, policy or speak against government policy and he did that on alcohol and he did that on tobacco. And, and, and I know uh, he was also very close to resignation at that time, except uh, that uh, the, the, the government dropped its opposition to the private members bill that eventually brought in the ban on environmental tobacco smoke. So that's, that's, what, that's what a public health system does for you. It has some, some centrality. Now, Public Health England is, is a much weaker body than that, again, with um, limited practical public health um, uh, content and it is an executive agency, was an executive agency of the department. Can I just make one final point on, on that is, and, the, and I'm very worried about the direction of travel. The direction of travel, uh, the abolition of Public Health England and its replacement by the UN, uh, the UK uh, Health Security Agency is a very difficult position, I think, we, that we find ourselves in. And it very clearly is orientated towards that scientific role. It is um, in, the, in the founding uh, statements about it. It came into being on the 1st of April. Uh, it is seen as, and it says it's part of UK PLC and it is supposed to act as part of the medical and uh, uh, I can't remember, the scientific establishment or the, the scientific function. And it really is part of the medical industrial complex, uh, I think. And that's the direction of travel, which is much more towards the science and much more towards uh, a corporate notion of, of health as part of the responsibilities of UK PLC. Thank you very, thank you very much, Gabriel. I'd like to go back um, briefly to Deepti and then to our co-founder, James Harding. Deepti, you had a quick um, report I think you wanted to make. Yeah, I, I just want to respond to some of the comments uh, by Ian. So I'm not really <laughs> ready to uh, let the scientific community off the hook because I don't think it was just the politicians. I mean, certainly the government hugely failed in this. I don't think anybody is doubting that. But there are statements that have been made by scientists and papers published by scientists that contained cross misinformation. So Patrick Valence, we know, spoke very early about herd immunity being a strategy out of this. I know he changed his mind on that, but we heard from John Van Tam quite early on when we knew this was aerosol transmitted, suggesting that masks, uh, there was very little evidence to suggest masks, although many countries were using them as per the precautionary principle. We heard Jenny Harris repeatedly say that schools were safe and there was no transmission happening. All the schools were closed in January because uh, of high levels of transmission. Um, we know that um, there were papers published from SAGE very early on that really underestimated the impact of uh, test trace and, uh, and isolate very early on because assumptions about testing times were very, very long. Um, there are papers that have been published by members of SAGE based on uh, systematic reviews that are highly biased that suggest that schools uh, don't transmit. And a lot of this has now been debunked, but these are not things that are being done by scientists who are you know, having to do this or being used by just the political community. These are statements that have been made by scientists in public. Uh, based on their understanding of the disease or based on their idea of what's happening. And I think if you are leading the pandemic response, you have the responsibility to be well-informed, consult widely and present the right evidence. And if you're not doing that, then I'm sorry, you are actually at fault. And it's not just the politicians because they were saying the same things the politicians were saying. They were saying uh, test trace uh, is only done by lower middle income countries. It's, it shouldn't be used beyond the containment stage. They were saying quarantines are not useful 
I mean, Jenny Harry said this, this was not said by a, just by a politicians. So either they believed it or they were saying this because they were not entirely independent. Either way, it doesn't paint a good picture. Okay, thank you, Didi. Uh, I'd like to go to our co-founder um, and editor-in-chief, James Harding. James, hi. Matt, thanks. It's a completely, completely um, fascinating conversation. I, I just wanted to say, say we, we set up this idea of the thinkings that we would host kind of open news meetings and then we'd put in place this one rule, which was there would be no questions because everyone should come with an informed point of view. Having done that now, I thought, hang on a second, I've got to now rip that rule up because I've got nothing but questions, Matt. So for, forgive me for kind of barging. All right. Um, uh, and I also, by the way, saw uh, what well, I thinking we heard recently about the future of London. I heard from Robert Lester, and I see he's here too. Yes. I'd love, love to hear his view, view in a moment. But so, so here, are my, here are just sort of firstly two responses. One is just to Ian's point about the extent to which science has been manipulated or scientists have been manipulated by politicians. I think, Ian, that everyone can see kind of the grotesque failings of political decision makings and the personalities of, of politicians. There's a question here for the kind of culture and character of scientists when they come into public health decision making. And, and I think that deserves its own question and shouldn't be obscured by the failures of our politicians. And there's a second point, which I think was also raised by by your comment, which is, look, what happened in Washington and London? Why is it countries with great scientific cultures ended up having such um, terrible outcomes? And I wonder whether it was the cult of Witty, the cult of Fauci, the extent to which we tried to condense competing scientific opinions in the, in the opinion of one person, and that that was that was a combination of both politics and to a certain extent, the hierarchy of science. So I'd love to understand what the better version of it is. But my three specific questions are, do we focus too much on February, March and not enough on September, October? And surely if there was a failure of science, by then it, it, it really was science's job to say, look, we can see the way this thing is going to happen, going to roll out in the winter and, uh, and we need to act more, more quickly. The, 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 the second question I've got is, we had Jeremy Hunt come to one of these thinkings a few weeks ago, and his complaint was about release of information, that there should be real-time release of scientific information, even where those are competing, right? And I wondered what you all think about that, about whether or not that will just silence scientific comment or actually enable it. Um, and, and the third point is, how do we get, Anthony, to your your point about an email that goes in on January, I think you said, was it the 24th, I think you said? How, how do we create a culture where that kind of exchange is being made much more public without creating a, a fear, right? That was one of the, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? When someone of your stature is writing that email, I'd quite like to know that at the end of January, but I also realize that in my, but I would also run it at the top of the news on the BBC, uh, or uh, at the times, and that might be irresponsible. So those are my questions. Thank, thanks, James. Um, uh, Anthony, do you want to have a go? Whoops, gosh. Um, yeah, very tricky. Um, the Just to address some of James's points, and also coming back to Ian, I mean, I agree with Ian that politics can override and, and uh, science and, and the role of Dominic Cummings, he shouldn't have been there. I mean, you just shouldn't have had him in the room. And the first thing that a chief scientific advisor would do would say, no, this is, you know, out. And, and the, the other failing is we didn't get the, as Deepti said, the international advisors in yeah. to look at this. We didn't have, where were the people from WHO? I mean, Bruce Aylward, had written his China report by February the 24th, showing exactly how they had suppressed it. And yet that was never used. Where was um, uh, the guy from uh, Gabriel Lung from Hong Kong, who's a brilliant kind of public health and virological person who controlled it. So that that didn't happen. But my the, the one thing I disagree with Ian about is the problem is that the strategy hasn't changed. 
the strategy is still not to suppress the virus. I, there was something by the BBC correspondent today saying that, you know, it's all going to be fine because once we're all vaccinated, it will just become an endemic disease and there could be 30,000 deaths a year. But that's not much worse than a bad flu season. Actually, flu is vastly overestimated. I looked at the CDC figures on flu uh, for 2019 today, and in America they had five and a half thousand deaths from flu proven you know there may have been others but equally others may have been misinterpreted as flu you know in Britain that would mean one to two thousand deaths a year so if we're accepting 30,000 deaths as an acceptable endemicity to say nothing of the tens and tens of thousands of people that may have long covid and we don't know where long covid is going to end this is a failure of population health science and my biggest criticism is that science is being defined as, as Gabriel said, as part of the medical industrial complex, it's vaccines, it's lab science, that's science. Actually, I, you know, we're population health scientists. We do large scale trials, population trials, community engagement trials. And that's what you need to have. You need to have people that understand about this. WHO got it very wrong on Ebola at the beginning of the big West African one and everyone flew in all these immediate hospitals and people in masks and all the rest of it. Actually, they got it under control when the Ugandan guy came up and said, this is crazy. This is about community engagement and getting people to understand that you don't touch dead people and you have to quarantine people early. Very basic behavior stuff, but you have to engage with communities. We're still not doing that. And I'll just finish on the most worrying thing I heard Andrew Marr on Sunday interview, she'll remain nameless, but the lead, one of the main advisors on our test and trace. And he said, but what about isolation? Which is absolutely fundamental, because if you can test and trace as many people as you like, but if you're not isolating, and, and she said, well, yeah, when we phone people up, they sell it, tell us they're isolating and people are good like that. Yet all the evidence, you know, you want to go is that if you don't have local follow up, if you don't pay poor people and there are five million people on zero hours contracts to isolate, they don't isolate. And the figures showed 18 percent people actually isolated. The Chinese had, you know, 9000 people in Wuhan within two weeks going around, making sure that people were abiding by the rules. So we failed to do that. And I still see us failing. We still think we're going to get out of this with just a vaccine and then it will be a bit endemic. But high endemic death rates is not, to me, public health control. Thanks very much, Angie. Can we uh, go to Robert Letcher now, who uh, is with us? Robert, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. I think it's really... can, I, can I just uh, put you on the spot and um, I obviously want to hear your broader thoughts about the whole issue we've been discussing, but do you, where do you stand on the whole transparency issue that James mentioned, which, you know, has been, you know, Jeremy Hunt's argued hard for transparency, others have said transparency actually is, has limited value, people speak less candidly, it encourages minutes that are meaninglessly consensual, what, what, what do you think about that? No, I, well, I, so, so I think I think my conclusion, I mean, I wasn't very clear about this at the beginning, but my conclusion is that the more transparency, the better. So I, I think SAGE was uh, initially too secret a body. Uh, picking up some of Anthony's comments, I think, at the beginning, I think SAGE was not rightly constituted. I think fundamentally we were not pandemic ready as a country and as a system. I think Gabri Gabriel's points about public health, absolutely spot on. We were woefully caught short on public health, we've disinvested in public health. Uh, and the, the consequence of that, was, there was, I'm, I'm getting slightly off your question, I appreciate it, but just let me just briefly say this, that the, we compensated for that by far too much central command and control. That was true about how we tried to manage the contact tracing, it was true for how we tried to manage the testing. Um, and so I think we've learned a lot of lessons and I think we were a flu ready country, we were caught short and we probably didn't have the right people providing the advice at that critical early phase. And you were asking whether the problem was uh, early or late. I think we never recovered from that two week period in March when the lockdown was too late. That, that really our fate was sealed at that point.
Um, and it's a shame that we, we've got some great experts and you've got some of them on the panel this evening. Um, that SAGE committee was not constituted with perhaps the sources of the best advice in retrospect. Um, and, you know, we live, we live with the consequences. But transparency, yes, I think it would have been healthy for everybody to have more transparency. And one of the other lessons that have come out of all this is, of course, in some senses, people talk about the science. Very often there isn't the science. There were many things we didn't know early on. There's some things we're not entirely clear about now. But I think um, the science is a slightly misleading concept. Well, I, on that point, I mean, you know, by September, you have a fairly open rift between Witty and Balance on the one hand and the government on the other over a circuit breaker. And, uh, it, you know, I think in late September, Witty and Balance hold a, take the unprecedented step of holding their own press conference, just the two of them, which, looking back, was perhaps more symbolic than we um, registered at the time. Uh, and actually, you then have the failure of the tiered system going back into lockdown uh, November the 5th. You know, this, this, it seems to me, was at least as bad, perhaps, that, as, as all the uh, failures of earlier in 2020, because, as you said, you know, we, we were meant to have learned from the first wave, and yet the relationship between scientists and politicians seems, if anything, to have become more frayed by then. Mm. Yeah, um, so it was actually the Academy of Medical Sciences we hosted that press conference that you're describing with um, with Chris and Patrick at the time, and they were very open, I think, um, and very honest and uh, very modest. Um, but um, I mean, you, you you are right. I think that uh, the lack of that circuit breaker, which I think the advice was fairly clear um, at that point, the advice wasn't so clear to begin with. Um, but for that circuit breaker, I think the advice was fairly clear. Um, and I think there, uh, I'm with, with, was it Ian who was talking about the sort of political override that at that point happened? I mean, obviously, I, I, would, I would hate to have been prime minister through the last 12 months. I have to say that. And balancing the damage to the economy and all that stuff um, with, um, with, with the escalating death rate, very, very difficult task, very difficult judgments that had to be made. But I think I still would go back to my point. I think we never recovered from uh, the slowness with which we acted uh, in February and March. Um, I'd like to come back to Ian Golden. I see time is marching on fast, sadly. Ian, you had a couple of points I think you wanted to make. Yeah, um, I, I think it's, it's important to stress, and you know, as, as terrible as austerity has been, uh, for the safety net, the dismantling of the NHS, uh, privatization, and all the other reasons that have correctly been given. There are countries which are far, far, have far worse systems than the UK that have done much, much better, that have no effective national health systems like we know them, that don't have the scientific community that we have, that have, you know, very, very low deaths and have handled it. Um, and the reason that has happened is because basically they followed WHO guidelines quickly and fast and very strongly. Um, and, and so they've managed. So what I find puzzling, and I totally take all the points that have been made about the weakness of the scientific community, but uh, what would be a problem is if they were actively as a consensus group from SAGE consistently getting it wrong. And my sense is the main thing they've got wrong is not to listen to the global community. Uh, they have got many things wrong. And I think uh, Dipti is absolutely right to point that out. And there are individuals that have consistently got things wrong. But as a community, if we want to blame them, uh, we'd have to say that they were doing something that the rest of the world hasn't done. Of course, France and Italy and others have also made mistakes like this. But there does seem to be this arrogance and exceptionalism uh, at the heart of it. The, the final point I, I'd like to make is, of course, we have the luxury in the UK of saying when, when we're trading off lives and livelihoods that we can pay 10% of GDP to keep people alive, to furlough, to keep firms alive. Most uh, developing countries basically have to make the trade-off between starvation or COVID. Uh, and that's a very, very, very difficult and more intense thing. And, you know, I've seen that play out in 
in the country that I'm originally from, South Africa, uh, and it's playing out in India at the moment and in many other places. I think that is, we're fortunate that we don't have that. So when the politicians here get it wrong, uh, they're getting it wrong despite the fact that they have the wherewithal uh, to keep people alive in lockdown. Uh, that's not a luxury that, that people in South Africa or politicians in South Africa or India have. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, can I turn to Gabriel before the, the clock uh, strikes 7.30, Gabriel? Uh, thank you. I, I just want to make one point about something that uh, is still a problem. Anthony talked about the isolation element and uh, helping people to isolate is really, really important. And, but the government has relied upon science and theory in their enormous support for testing. On the 16th of March last year, w, the Director General of the World Health Organization called for mass testing and he included testing of people who uh, were close contacts. And uh, testing, you would think that testing people at high risk was the, one of the most important things you do, but we still do not test close contacts of people who have been found to be positive with COVID-19. Amazing, it, it doesn't follow the advice from CDC, the advice from uh, the European Center for Disease Prevention Control or from WHO, we don't test these people, yet we scatter other tests around the, around the place like pixie dust and, 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 and hope that something will happen. But if you are not testing the people who are close contacts as soon as you can, and if you're not doing backward tracing, not just who they've been with recently, but looking backwards to see where those uh, infections came from, you're not doing the job properly. And we've never done the job properly. We've relied instead on lockdowns uh, as, as, as really the only tool in the toolkit. And what we, I think there was an opportunity, I think there was a second opportunity in the summer when numbers of cases were relatively low. There were some places, particularly around Greater Manchester, where they still had endemic infection going on. But when the lockdown was lifted, they were relatively low. Uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland both had zero deaths and cases in very low numbers for a significant period during that, that time. And that was our opportunity to put a proper fine test, trace, isolate and support system, as Anthony introduced me to the term and the concept. And he, he was absolutely right. And that wasn't done either. And we're still, Scotland introduced testing of close contacts on the 18th of February. Northern Ireland introduced it on Monday, on the 19th of April, uh, more than a year after WHO made it clear that, that that was what needed to be done. And we're still not doing it in England and Wales. I'm a, I am shocked and amazed by this. It's such a failure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. So, sadly, we're, we're run out, out of time, and, 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 and I'm, I apologise for not having been able to come to more people, but uh, I hope you would appreciate that it was uh, uh, really fascinating. Uh, to hear speaks of such quality and, and I've been left with reams of notes from which I'll try and distill a little bit. Um, I mean one thing that, that does strike me just generally is that we're, we're conducting this conversation under the umbrella of a, a measure of um, certainty that we will exit this pandemic due to the success of the vaccine rollout and how very different and how much more stressful this conversation might have been had We've not had the good fortune of the um, of AstraZeneca and Pfizer being cleared by the MIHA, MHRA in, in December. Uh, what a different scenario that would be. I mean, just to go, go, go through a few brief points. I mean, I, it's very hard to exaggerate the importance of what Anthony said at the beginning about the, the need for action and the, uh, the dangers of inertia. Um, and I think also that, you know, uh, I think you made a very, really, really important point about um, what, what to me remains quite the quite shocking exceptionalism of, of science and um, in, in this country and, and you know, things that were known in, and in the press about uh, how this, how countries that had been through SARS and MERS were coping better and using lockdown measures better. Uh, did not seem to filter through. And I, I have to say, I, frankly, that I do find that still mystifying. I think Ian made a very good case about the, you know, the importance of always, um, you know, remembering that uh, ministers decide, advisors advise, and the, the, the decision making ultimately rested with the politicians. And there is an irony, in, as he said, in the two, you know, great scientific nations, the US and the UK, performing so badly. Um, 
Uh, also, though, I, I would go back to what Gabriel said about you know, the, the, the importance of remembering that these were people who considered themselves advisors and uh, were not used to the level of transparency that then was thrust upon them. And I think that is a point to which we can return looking ahead at, at where we're going to go. And I, I, James and Robert, in their different ways, made this point about the, 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 the absolute centrality of uh, transparency to this, this whole uh, question and how you do it and how you how you make sure that the minutes are you know accurate and and don't reflect a kind of um a, a massaged number 10 um friendly truth is very very difficult um i mean the broadest possible point to draw from this i think is that if you look ahead the crises that we're going to face in the next few decades um or the challenges at any rate the climate emergency artificial intelligence and um, one assumes different kinds of um, epidemics and possibly pandemics are all going to involve this relationship between politicians and scientists. And we need to uh, look at the relationship between power and knowledge and authority, those two separate things, and, and perhaps work out how expertise uh, relates to democratic accountability in, in, in a much broader way and that you know the, we, we've we've conducted and tested the destruction the structures that we have and in many respects they've been found wanting and of course there will be individuals who are singled out in the reckoning but there are also systems and and cultural changes we need to make and and uh, and right quick because uh, the challenges are just around the corner um it's already uh 7 35 i've kept you all far too long uh, but thank you all for coming, thank you to our fantastic panel, and thank you for spending uh, an hour and a bit uh, uh, on a Wednesday evening, um, considering this very important aspect of the pandemic that we're not quite out of. Um, uh, sorry that we can't offer you a glass of wine, perhaps those days are uh, coming back sooner than we'd feared. Um, a very good evening to you all, and thank you.